And it's like this dance. We just, we have forgotten how to dance with our sex hormones. And in order to get back into it, we have to sort of rediscover ourselves. And, and I still make, I still make decisions that are like not the smartest for that time of my cycle. Not, you know, and that's, that's, that's how we learn, right? That's how we grow. Two, one, zero, Hi, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. This is your host, Orion. Thank you so much for being here. I have with me today the phenomenal Christine Weitzel. She is the founder of Sherpa Breath and Cold and Warrior Women Mode. She is a renowned women health expert featured on stages worldwide. She is a health and high performance maven, nutrition specialist, certified fitness trainer, master breathwork and deliberate cold exposure coach, focusing on improving health. Christine also hosts the Well Power podcast, expanding biohacking with an even broader audience, including how females can align with their hormones and life cycles and how far we can go in pursuing optimal performance. So if you are interested in discovering more about how to balance your hormones, live better, biohack your physiology, and learn how to do a conscious uh, cold plunge, which means staying in icy water for a few minutes in order to get mind clarity and body clarity clarity and balance your hormones. This is the episode for you. Christine is a very kind and interesting person and this episode will teach you some new cool things about yourself and about your biology. And without further ado, on to the show. Hey, Christine, welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm wonderfully excited to spend some time with you chatting about all the ways that we can get people healthier. Yeah, so before we begin, can you share a little bit about your origin story and how did you become the powerhouse that you are today? Sure, yeah. <laughs> it's a roundabout story. When I was younger, I was a bit quirky and curious and um, interested in I was a dancer, grew up dancing and wondering how I could navigate food and nutrition around the physique that I wanted because I like like to eat a lot of things, but I also had to keep some sort of physique that would make sense for me dancing in the world of ballet and performing arts high school and things like that. I stayed pretty curious and researched a lot around ways I could eat differently and juicing and all these different things. You know, many people come and have have worked in the wellness space or in health and wellness or the biohacking world coming, taking their like mess and making it into their masterpiece. And that may have been something that's like a physical challenge that they, they were working to overcome. I think a lot of what I was working through was um, internalized, right? Whether it was like a little bit of eating dis disorder and, and a little bit of mental um, lack of self-worth that was existing mm -hmm. in my younger years, it speaks to a lot of the women that I work with today and then also just really navigating the landscape of what it meant to be a woman in the world of wellness and in the world of biohacking when there were so many men around. Right, I was in this, I have this story from like working, I grew up a dancer, I got this different shape when I was in my teenage years, I couldn't dance sort of the same way just because a ballerina looked a specific, had a specific type of body when I was younger. My body got very shapely very quickly in my late mm -hmm. teens and then I moved on into the world of wellness and, and working in various different careers in corporate America while I was getting all these certifications around food, around fitness, around like optimizing my health. And I worked with lots of males. And so the story about how we show up as women powerfully and how we are these powerhouse badass women in the world, that was the story that I sort of took on too much to a fault because I was living the day to day around a lot of male energy and I needed to communicate in that way. So for me, my story, the story arc of getting curious and trying to juice and understanding paleo and primal and keto and all these things over the last 15 or 20 years really was born out of being connected to the biohacking space because of all the men that started in that, in that sphere. And the breakout for me or the, the biggest lessons have come when I realized that we need to be doing things differently as females. And 
really the ways, the things that have spoken most passionately to me in modalities in the last couple of years, like breath work and cold exposure, those things have been a way to reset or to break the pattern of being so alpha and understanding how I can create stillness, down regulation, state shifting, emotional shifting in my own body. And I've been working mm -hmm. with clients in that regard. So the story is a very like to unwind it all would take us a whole entire hour. But a lot of it is really around understanding a key issue with females and a key issue with many people, which is we are equally sensitive as we are powerful. And that specifically speaking to female physiology, the sensitivity is our superpower. The sensitivity is where the magic is. The intuition is the thing that we've been ignoring for a long time and doing the dance between both sides of the coin. And this doesn't mean that males aren't out there having that as well, but all of us figuring out where our sensitivity lies, where our power lies, and, and not feeling like we have to be on the train of we're going to grind and grind and grind until we, you know, hit burnout. So yeah. that's really my biggest goal in the world is to understand how I can state shift people and work with more females than males, but I certainly work with both to understand our physiology and understand how we can balance that sensitivity and that intuition to be able to like fulfill our dreams. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's where it's all navigated itself to. Yeah. It's beautiful. It, uh, it reminds me of my journey a little bit with all like, I want to train like the men, I'm going to be like the men. And then you know, I, I couldn't even like find love because I was so much in this like, oh, just like one aspect of myself and not integrating the whole of me. And I'm talking about the internal masculine, masculine, feminine dance. So I totally relate to that. And yeah. I love to yeah. find stillness. I'm still looking for it. Maybe I need <laughs> a cold plunge, but we're going to talk about it a little later. Yeah. So when you discovered biohacking, what does biohacking means to you? And when did you discover it? So probably it's like pushing, we're almost close to like the 15 year mark, I think, since Dave Asprey coined the phrase. Uh, biohacking was used before in a slightly different format, a little bit more around like biological research, but biohacking, the specific term that's been used pretty widely in like media and commonplace terminology is a word that was coined by Dave Asprey, uh, sort of the godfather of the biohacking mission, who was born out of like the Silicon Valley tech bubble, right? He had been invested in things and really into the, the, the tech world. And so it, it felt a lot like tech innovations in the beginning. But I think what it means to me and what it's meant for quite some time is just where we find ancient modalities and things that we're working in a landscape to shift the environment in our cells, right inside and outside of our cells. There's plenty of ancient practices we've utilized. And that's like the arc of that going all the way to the other side, which is like hyper modernized technological advances mm -hmm. and how we can use things that feel either cutting edge or even bleeding edge that might feel a little bit more risky. And so how we can utilize the tools that are safe and effective tools in the landscape from ancient practices to modern day, modern day technology in the very best way so that we can live longer, better, happier, and healthier, right? It's about when I'm 80, I want to be able to step off the curb, have a little, oh, I stepped on a stone and have a little trip and I don't fall and break a hip. I don't, you know, learn. I understand what I can do now to be able to live longer and happier and healthier. Mm -hmm. I thought that you were going to say when I'm going to be 80, I'm going to skydive. Well, I mean, sure, sure. And maybe 180, you know, like Dave would say, we're going to, we can make ourselves live to 180. But the question isn't about how long we live. It's like the quality in our years, I think, and utilizing tools now when we're younger to understand how we can potentiate a life that feels vibrant and uh, vigorous and like that we can go do all the things that we want, whether that be like taking walks or running triathlons or, or doing triathlons or like having lots of sex or whatever it is that we, we want to do. And so how do we optimize, right? This is health optimization at its finest in some ways. And many people before the term was even coined say, we were always talking about how to optimize our health, right? You go into the fitness scene and people were working on, you know, human performance optimization. So like there, it has existed in some iteration or another. And now we have this term, which is a, a way that like-minded people got together in community and definitely biohacking. And it's a beautiful community. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I love the community of biohackers. I know the term comes a lot, a lot of, uh, with a lot of stigma, but it's not going away. It's just a word. Yeah, I think it comes with some stigma. I think some people really think, well, anyone who's talking about biohacking is just like throwing things at the wall. You know, there's just like a lot of judgment around it in some way. 
but I'm a fan of it. I use it. You know, I think some women, it's a pretty masculine term. So I understand that many women want to use health optimization or um, biosyncing or other things like that. It's all beautiful. It's just semantics though, right? It's like, how do we optimize our health and well-being? How do we live longer, better, healthier? Yeah. I really like uh, Dave Asprey and he was a guest on the show a while ago. And we, it's, it's kind of like throughout, I don't know, the last de- decade, we just kind of like come across each other, say hi, bye, connect, disconnect. It's kind of nice. And um, I really like, I used to live in Santa Monica near the Bulletproof Labs. And I went there to try the infrared sauna and the, and the cryotherapy and, and some of their other uh, gadgets. It was really fun. As a female... What is the difference in the approach for when it comes to biohacking and trying all those things? Like, what do we need to to look for? Yeah, I think there there are strong differences. I think it 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 needs to be said that when I'm talking about females, I'm talking about physiological females, mm-hmm. non exogenous hormone usage for the most part. And I just say that because there's so many different ways that humans come into their fullest self and their fullest happiness. And some people are are doing you know, they're transitioning in life or they're on hormone hormones for various different reasons. And we can talk about that too. But when I'm speaking about females here, it's specifically about physiological females. And that's because there is a set of hormones and landscape that is different than physiological males. And how we navigate that is something that over the, the, the last 40, 50 years, we're getting hopefully better at, but it's still not quite prevalent enough because women weren't shown in the research for a very long time. Um, we were relatively, let's call it banned from the research, or we were like left out of the research because we were too many variables, having a period and uh, different hormone cycles and all of that. And so a lot of protocols that existed were made for men and then just adopted by women. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, for good or for bad. And so I think the first thing to fly at 10,000 feet and say is like, I, when I coach people, I always coach the individual. And that's really important. We all have unique bio individual needs and lab work and things like that. But generally speaking with women, I tend to feel like we, this philosophy of going hard and the philosophy of leaning in 110% to everything that we do doesn't necessarily serve us as well as it serves males. And so the first thing is like, how do we tap into this? like ancient intuition, this beautiful neurochemistry that we're given this cycle, whether you're talking about our reproductive years or the cycle that we have every month, or you're talking about the cycle of life as we are either, you know, preteen or we're premenopausal or menopausal and we have different hormonal cycles. We need to sort of know where we are in the space of our life and our intuition and our strengths, and then understand that we can create like an energetic relationship with the world that feels like we're allowing things to come in that we have this balance of soft which can also be strong everyone a lot so many women think soft is weak and it's not about that but we can be soft we can be sensitive we can feel into the things that we know to be true and balancing that with our ability to you know stand strong in the midst of challenges and you know bear children and all of that and how we navigate both of those things So the first thing is how do we understand ourselves as women in the world and in our life and in our interrelations, because it's going to be different for a lot of us, but we're working with the same physiology and a similar hormone profile in a specific, like, let's say 40 years of our reproductive years. And how can we attenuate? How can we optimize based on what's going on in our physiology? So to give a really targeted example, a lot of times I'm more conservative on fasting and on adding layers of stress into our bodies for females, because we can be in many parts of our life or parts of the month, more sensitive to stress, more open to like being, having anxiety or depression or any of those things. We sleep a little, we need to sleep a little bit more than males. And so I look at the first layer as like, what are the stresses we are inducing on our daily lives? And how can we peel those things back to say, let's err on the side of caution and work towards our own unique bio-individuality. Right. We see a lot about fasting. Everyone's like fasting, fasting. Now, there is a case to be made for fasting in some ways. If you look at Mindy Pelz's, Dr. Mindy Pelz's work around fasting and menopause and shifting some of the things that are happening in that state. But generally speaking across the board, I think that women are going hard on keto and perhaps too, car- too hard. Women are going hard on fasting. They're like six, 18, six, 18, six, that those hours and that strict of a schedule of fasting can actually, if we start out, especially with dysregulated hormones, it can actually be bad for us. 
So understanding how to titrate stress and understanding our own bodies in space and then layering protocols on top of that, right? And so the, that's sort of like the place where women, I believe, need to really be strongly playing. And the one other thing I'll add to that is just really around fitness. And that is how do we pick up heavy weights? How do we move things in a way that is going to support less overall stress, like as if we were doing 20 cardio classes a week versus going to the gym and lifting four times a week and just doing two or three cardio classes or running, et cetera. Of course, there's like, you know, athletes in the world who are training for marathons who are going to have to run longer, harder, faster, they're female athletes, and there's a way to do that well. But approaching our health and approaching how we optimize from the very strong standpoint of women, and I think also that's either getting female advisors or men who have seen research and worked with many females. A lot of my mentors are males, mm -hmm. but they have worked with many, many females and they've seen time and time again, sort of the best ways to work in their physiology. So it's, it's yeah. never easy, right? It's never simple. It's never one answer. It's just, we don't have to do it like everyone else. And by that, in many ways, I mean men, and this is not males against females. You know, this is just for whatever reason in life we have had males in the workforce and setting up the 24-hour cycle with their hormone cycles to the way work world where the work corporate world works we've had men putting together fitness programming since the dawn of time and not necessarily cycling in what's going on with women and we have sort of had mm -hmm. this like male structure in the research and so this is what a lot of things are based on right and you all the way up to pharmaceuticals anyone who's taking any kind of medicine a lot of it has been approved through research that was done on men and there has not been enough significant research on females. And we see some females having a lot of adverse reactions to medication because they were never in the research when it was pushed through to be approved because there were more males in the research. So all of that is like, that's a lot to unpack, I know, but I think it's, it's worth saying so that we can understand as women in the world how to scale back and say, okay, I read this thing in a magazine and is it really applicable to me? and to be doing the research and advocating for our own bodies and our own health. Yeah, and, and it makes sense because if you give the same pill for this, well, let's say 250 pound male or 100 pound female, and there is no research, of course they'll have uh, uh, side effects. Yeah. And so it, it goes back to what you said about intuition and listening to our bodies and mm -hmm. listening to the warning signs more than the outside voices, even if they are very uh, knowledgeable or, or wear uh, a, a coat or, or, or uniform. It's all about listening to ourselves and our intuition. Yeah. So we talked about the, the cycle and how like there is a, the guys have a 24 hour cycle and, and we, and, and their hormones don't change <laughs> and we have different cycles throughout the month. Can you unpack a little bit and share a bit about the cycles uh, uh, like a female cycle and, and how does the hormone work with with exercise, with nutrition? When do we need more sleep? When do we need to go harder? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of discourse and conversation around this right now. I just interviewed Andy Galpin, who's sort of like a foremost authority on uh, building muscle and physiology when it comes to physique transformation and a researcher and just an amazing guy all around. And, and there's 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 a lot of lean into the studies and I would say a little bit the jury is out on some of the, the amounts of research that we need. And then also there is some strong evidence to point us directionally as women and when and how we should be training and working out. And then if you layer on top of that anecdotal evidence and experiential, meaning I've worked with hundreds of women and being able to see and feel into our bodies at different times of the month, then there's a landscape that we can, there's sort of a pathway forward. And uh, when you're looking at it, uh, you know, I look at it through the lens of how we should be training, how I believe we should train, how I think we can eat best for ourselves, and how we can cycle those things around times that we might feel more insular or more extroverted. So if you look at uh, my good friend Kayla Osteroff, she really speaks a lot about the neurochemistry of females and our cycles that we are she would say I'm four different people during the course of the month because we have four parts of our monthly cycle. And I'm like, whatever, I'm 28 different people, you know, <laughs> every day. <a> different. <laughs> and we are every day a little different. And depending on what we do and what we take and ingest, we can have different hormones. Throughout the month, throughout the day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's interesting to look at that. And, 
you know, there are definitive times. And again, what I'm speaking about is not maybe doesn't hold true for 100 percent of the females. But I would say for the majority of women, we're talking about, um, you know, the, the clinical terminology is like day one of our cycle is the first day we bleed is the first day we get our period. So it's like day one bleed. Great. That's menstruation. That's like part one of the cycle, which is also interesting to me because I always feel like when you look at menstruation, it's it feels sort of chronologically like it's coming. It's the final cleansing out if you're not getting you know pregnant, a cleansing out of the system to release you know the egg and the tissue and all that, the unfertilized egg. And so that feels like that would to me would be the end of the cycle. But probably it was males that were like, well, here's a marker for day one. So day one bleed. That's menstruation. Um, that last you know cycles are different lengths for every woman. And if you're listening to this and you don't know that, that's okay. Like count your cycle days. Find a way to track it in an app. Understand how you're feeling. What you're, you know, if you have a, a period, how long it is. What your discharge looks like. How you know all these things that we don't talk about enough. Just get a sense of your cycle. And then when you start to have your, um, it's sort of the lowest hormone phase during our period. It's like we are not men, but we are closest to men. We are like just, we have lower hormones during that time. And so when we look at the period, it's actually a great time to hit the gym and train. It's a good time to get in an ice bath. It's like an okay time to fast. It, Dr. Mindy Pels would say it's a great time to fast. And that being said, some women day one, day two of their period, they're like, ugh. I don't want to have anything to do with anyone. I feel like X and Y, or I don't want to train, or I'm tired, or all of that's fine. Intuitively, if you need more rest, then still get more rest, and that's okay, right? Your hormones are not going to be exactly the same as my hormones. But traditionally, I, we can say great time to fast, great time to train, especially if you have any kind of cramping and stuff. Getting lymph and getting your body moving can help ease cramps, ease PMS, any symptoms like that. Then we go into this beginning of the follicular phase, like the follicular phase encompasses menstruation, but follicular phase will go all the way up to like, let's say day 15 of the month, something like that. Um, 13 to 15, somewhere in there is the third phase of the cycle, which is ovulation. It's typically like, uh, I don't know, 36 hours, something like that. So again, a little different from every woman. And also let me say, you know, I'm certainly not like a sex and hormone expert in, in that regard of being able to speak so clinically to that, but I know hormones when it comes to how we are navigating, optimizing our health, training, fitness, and wellness. And so ovulation is a time, generally speaking, where women are feeling extroverted. If you read some of the books and research out there, or you listen to some of, you know, you talk to other women, it's a time where extroverted, it's a time that it's like great time to go out and like negotiate a big business deal and you know, I always talk about these couple of days in our in our ovulation anyway, these couple of days in our month of like, I'm extroverted, I'm feeling good, I want to put on my best pair of jeans or my red high heels, throw on a red <laughs> lip, go out in the world, be extroverted. Like it's weird by design that way because we're ovulating. So hundreds of years ago, it made us feel <laughs> like we wanted to be social and go out because you know what, if we're going to procreate and have children, we have to have semen and in order to get semen we got to go out on the town you know like that was just like or whatever out on the out of the rocks i don't know and so that is like just this beautiful opportunity for us to be more extroverted it's a great time to train to lift heavy to be in the gym to take less rest days that whole kind of like post period into ovulation phase is a really great time to build muscle slow steady strong right because at the similar time frame we have some more joint laxity and that's like again how the hormones are fluctuating and then the last phase or the, the next or final phase that uh, the four phases is our luteal phase. Our luteal phase is the back half of the cycle, maybe like day 15 to the end of it, right before we menstruate. And there's a week in there. Where we have some playroom, do some other things in, in training and fueling and whatnot. Um, you know, and, and, and the last week of the cycle is a time that I would say we're most sensitive. We're most um, adverse to stress and risk. We feel like we want to be a little bit more insular. And many women are listening to this right now are like, great, the five days leading up to my period. Yeah, I feel uncomfortable in my skin or I feel like, you know, you know, we don't have to be living with PMS symptoms. I mean, of course, there are people who are dealing with, mm -hmm. um, you know, just bigger medical challenges that that can produce those kinds of symptoms. But if we take care of ourselves and we intuit what our cycle is and we follow sort of along the way that our body's hormones are changing, we can have that time at the end of the month to maybe like not go to that dinner party or maybe, you know, take a hot salt bath or like have an extra rest day and just take better care of ourselves because the ebb and the flow, this whole piece of 
estrogen and progesterone fluctuating and low and high hormone phases, it's really our superpower. And it's like this dance. Yeah. We just, we have forgotten how to dance with our sex hormones. And in order to get back into it, we have to sort of rediscover ourselves. And, and I still make, I still make decisions that are like not the smartest for that time of my cycle, not, you know, and that's, that's, that's how we learn, right? That's how we grow. Right. Do you have any daily rituals that you do to, to go more inside and listen to yourself, to your body, to your heart? I mean, I, I have a meditation practice for me. That's a bit more around tuning out than tuning in. And it is a, mm. a way to tune in. But I think if I was going to describe meditation, it's sort of the letting go and surrendering to just like hearing my body, like being with what it is and not judging and not trying to say what's bubbling up. Why did I think that thing? What is trying to stay out of lists and rumination and sitting to let go. And breath work is the thing that helps me really tune in. So a lot mm -hmm. of times around sleep uh, in the morning, sometimes sitting in front of red, my red light panel, when I'm breathing, I can really feel into what feels good, what feels erratic, where I feel stuck. And so mm -hmm. breath, you know, I talk a lot about breath and cold in my, my practice and my work with people, but uh, breath is really a way that we can state shift like state shift times that feel scary, feel challenging, feel sad, feel like we've lost confidence, self-worth, feel like, you know, all this consistency of like social media comparison trap, all of that, we can sort of release that and, mm -hmm. you know, also prepare ourselves for big weightlifting in the gym or the big presentation we're giving to our boss or we're getting on stage to perform or to talk about something, you know, there's plenty of conferences I need to go and speak at and I love to speak. The bigger the audience, though, sometimes we have a moment of, okay, I need to sound good and I have to have all my documents together and I'm prepared, but what happens if I get up there and, right? My skirt rips or my whatever, or I trip up the stairs. <laughs> and we have all these things and I think we tap into the right kind of breath. We tap into our own capacity and our verbal acuity and we are setting ourselves up for success, you know, just by understanding what that when we're down regulated, it's we are behaving one way in a nervous system. And when we're up regulated, we are behaving another way in a nervous system. And to be able to play that again, so this is like playing the music that the dance of our hormones goes to. How do we figure that all out? Do you have a specific breathing exercise that you practice with people when you're on stage or when you when you you're by yourself and that like, you you have maybe a little bit of anxiety or, or or life happens like what do you do like what specifically how what's your type of breathing you do yeah i mean if it's just a little bit of anxiety i find a box mm -hmm. breath to be really great like let's talk about the simple tools because we're certainly not mm -hmm. using those enough and a box breath is just means that we have four sides to the breath the inhale a hold the exhale and another hold so we're holding on a retention or a suspension meaning holding on the in or holding on the out uh, after the exhale and so a box breath is really easy to do because you can just pick a number and say, okay, can I do a count of two, my own count of two? You don't need to be like using a clock, like two in, two hold, two exhale, two hold. I like a four box or a six box. And it's really like balancing both my breath, the understanding of what's happening in my body. It's giving a little oxygen to the tissues in the whole breath holds. And it's just evening you out, right? If people come super stressed uh, or if I felt some heightened anxiety, I would always lengthen my exhale, right? This is what I tell people in an ice bath when they're early on in their ice bath career or their ice bath practice is like breathe in for a count of two, out for a count of four, in for a count of four, out for a count of eight. We're just doubling the exhale because when you exhale longer, you're sort of tapped in on the exhale more to your parasympathetic calm nervous system. So that can help calm you relatively yeah. quickly. Um, yeah. And like those kind of simple things I think are important for us to layer in. It doesn't have to be a 45 minute breathwork yeah. experience, right? It can be, you know, when your friend or somebody in your life, people like an ex would have said this to me, like, just breathe. And it's like, you just want to punch that person in the face. Don't tell me to breathe. I'm already breathing. It's like getting yourself to be accountable enough to breathe for three to five minutes in a manner that can calm your nervous system and get you back into mm -hmm. your own body. Right. For me, it's about grounding my feet. Even if I'm sitting in a chair, I put both feet on the floor. Don't cross them. Have a little breath work in a two X. Like I was just talking about doubling mm -hmm. the exhale or a four box, six box breath. And you can state shift right at night when I'm trying to sleep. Plenty of women out there right now ruminating, can't sleep, anxiety, things going on in their mood. 
And I'm telling you, if you spend five minutes with like a 2x breathing or focusing on your exhale, nasal breathing only, you can really calm your state and put yourself yeah. to sleep. You know, and there are plenty of apps out there too. Um, I would say that's the low-hanging fruit. There's lots of different ways that I have breathwork recordings and things in the world, but there's those are the low-hanging fruit yeah. to get people started. Yes, I, I just did a box breathing, I think, two days ago. I have a three-year-old and he's my, like, I love him so much and he knows how to trigger me. Like, he really does. <laughs> and it was my one moment where there was a lot of screaming I just locked myself in the, in the bathroom and I'm just like, oh, one, two, three, four. And I was good after that, actually. After those two minutes, I was like, okay, now I can handle him and, and remember that he's the, this tiny human being is my son and I'm the mom and <laughs> we can, we can have a healthier dynamic. <laughs> yeah, this is like the space between stimulus and response, right? We all talk about this. It's been written about and talked about for eons, but it's like, what's, how do we get ownership of the space between the stimulus and our response to that stimulus? And so if we use breath to get that space back, then we can behave or perform in a way that we are, that feels good to us. It's not about better or worse, right? If you still want to fly off the handle and yell at someone, who am I to say? But I think it's probably not as healthy to do that, right? And like communication with everyone and your partner and Everything. I mean, I talk about breath work from performance athletes to people having better sexual experiences to people who are nervous to get on stage to people who are having a tough time sleeping, people with sleep apnea. Like I will, I will speak to, to, to breath in so many instances and it seems simple. And especially when I work, I have a, an online course and I work one-on-one -on -one with some women and they will say in like the first couple of weeks, I'll say, great, we're going to do a breathing exercise. And I talk to them about breath and oxygen and how we feel better. And like, you can even see, I have like my chart up from a client earlier today, this whole physiology chart of like ways to breathe. And we talk about it. And number one, they probably think it's a little nerdy. And number two, this is what I'm there to coach them on and in, in part of their program. And number three, I know many women who have come back to me a week or two weeks later after they've done seven to 14 days of like homework mm -hmm. around breath, simple tools I've given them or recordings I've had them do. And they say, wow, Kristen, I just, I was like, okay, I'm like, this is my coach and I'm paying her and I trust her and I love her and I'll do what she said. But I just like all this anxiety and my sleepless, sleeplessness and all of this, like breathing is not really going to do much for it. Like I'll do what she says because I'm, this is what I'm paying for and this is what she's saying. And they, they come back and they say, I just don't believe it. Like my anxiety's cut in wow. half. I'm resting better at night. I... I, especially like with just the nasal breathing piece, They're like just nasal breathing is going to make things better. And the answer is yes, it will. Like it's, it's about mm -hmm. awareness. And so it's typically inexpensive or free just to do your own breath work. And you can find YouTube videos and apps galore. And if we all tapped back into this, like primal understanding of our nervous system, we could do a lot of things better, heal ourselves, be better for our communities, communicate, Better everything, right? Better work, better play, better sex, better friendships, better parenting, everything. And that's like why breath to me is like, it's a baseline. Like sleep is a baseline. We've got to start understanding how we breathe. Have you ever had a mystical experience while breathing? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, a lot of them. I mean, it's, it's mystical. It depends on what you define as mystical. But, you know, if you can do some super ventilated breathing that scientifically will... Um, get you out of your default mode network, you know, like shifts your brain function. And so that you actually are tapped into more of your primal brain, which means like your rational mind is just taking a back seat for a while. And you can just have emotion or trauma or things come up, right? Where I've had some clearing in my life and definitely clients have had this when I do longer breathwork sessions, emotional mm -hmm. release that could come in as, it doesn't have to be tears. I think a lot of people think it's like screaming in tears. And, but like sometimes people have big laughter and sometimes people are just like, in awe and and sometimes people tap into their ancestors and you know there's so many different perspectives and ways people can feel but personally i've had lots of different i've you know i've done breath work where i'm like talking to like an ancient tribesman in africa right and in, in my in my mind's eye right certainly it's not in the room physically that anyone else can see i've had breath work that i've had you know a lot of emotional processing mm -hmm. i've had breath work that really opens me up to visions ideas thoughts or maybe potential just like designing my dreams in a way that's like, oh, I had a beautiful brainstorming idea come to the surface during breath work. 
I think it's helped given my body rest when I really need it. Helped me tap into burnout and understanding I'm actually an amazing human just as I am right in this space, in this body, in this form, whatever's going on. And slowing down might help me out. Yes. You know? So mystical experiences of all sorts and kinds, sure. Yeah, and I'm here for it. <laughs> but it's like you're on the science spectrum or you're on the woo spectrum. So like my... Uh, I took a, a, a plant medicine facilitation course because I work with breath and cold in the plant medicine space sometimes. And You do like ice bath with plant medicine? Uh, not while people are in the medicine, but around those experiences. If they're like a weekend long Ooh. experience, I love wow. to go and participate in holding space. Service is really my medicine. So I like to participate in holding space for those people, hosting and doing some leadership around breathing people, breath work for the, for the weekend and then putting people mid-weekend in a daytime when everyone's feeling quite aware and not altered to put people through ice because it's a very it's like the shortest distance between point a and b especially if people have had big experiences for them to really get into their own bodies get clear and a lot of that is really not about what's happening in the cold water yes you can be nowhere else but in the present in the cold but a lot of the beauty that comes from the ice bath during those weekends or just ice baths in general is about right when you get out the bliss chemical mm -hmm. cascade from your brain, like you're getting all these hits of dopamine and norepinephrine and oxytocin and stuff between the plunge and getting out. You're getting a deeper connection to people that you plunge with. Yeah, like your innermost truest childlike self can come out and play and it's a parasympathetic rebound in many ways. And that's amazing to see people process and integrate their plant medicine experiences utilizing that and um, just just so many beautiful things that come with it you know and again it's like it's nice to have a coach in those experiences because you want to be carried through yes it sounds like an amazing experience yeah it's and what comes what comes across from you is like how like it seems like you have a big heart and you really care about the people you work with it's just i can just feel it it's it just sounds like a wonderful experience yeah I mean, this is like my peak expression. I did all these things in my life with all of these jobs and all these transferable skills and I coach women and love it. And I get to do this work now that navigates through breath and cold and health and fitness optimization. And I feel super damn lucky um, to watch. <laughs> I'm not, that. I always say to clients, like, I'm not doing the work for you. I'll tell you the things to do. I'm opening the window or the door for you to rediscover the person that you've always been. And that's, oh, that's, that's the beautiful. lesson, you know, is like, we're already showing up wonderfully. And females who are listening to this right now, you know, like Orion and I are here to say to you, like, whatever you look like in the mirror, however you feel, it's you and you, it's you rediscovering this beautiful, incredible, wild, intuitive female that you are, and your capacity mm. is, is endless. And a lot of times, uh, I see clients and I have friends and, and sometimes myself even. We talk to ourselves in the mirror or just in general and our bodies in a way that we would never let a girlfriend get away with speaking that way, right? It's like, <laughs> of like negative self-talk. And so how do we let go of that? How do we actually say, I am incredible and so are you, especially in rooms of other women, right? Especially in the places where like you and I get together on this podcast, we can make more waves together and go further together by sharing some of this, you know, whether it just be health landscape Aww. or letting women look in the mirror and feel like, hell yeah, I'm all in. Hell yeah. And amen, amen, amen to everything you just said. Yes. You take people on experiences doing ice baths or you guide them or you coach them to, to be healthier. And obviously you also coach their mental state and their mindset. What happens when somebody takes an ice bath for the first time or or if somebody's listening and want to take an ice bath but what what are the 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 few things that you would guide them through yeah 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 and i like i've i was i've been coaching people through ice baths for over five and a half six years now i think about six years maybe and i probably have, i've put at least two thousand people in the ice one-on-one -on -one, so i've had a lot of seen a lot of different responses <laughs> Um, a lot of other groups putting them through the ice, just powering people through and um, super fun ways, super ritualistic ways, all different styles. And I would say that cold exposure, the first thing that's important to say is there are some contraindications. Um, a cold shower, if you want to talk about cold exposure, deliberate cold exposure, what I call in my 
I have a, a training, an instructor training, where I train people that's Sherpa Breath and Cold, um, SherpaBreathandCold.com. And that's really about sessions and creating instructors so that we can spread the word of these good practices to more and more people. So it, it's important to say there are some contraindications if you're talking about cold exposure, like intentional cold exposure, that is beyond a cold shower. Because we have cold showers, we have cryotherapy, we have ice baths, we even have like nature plunging, right? Dipping in nature. And the first cup, the first two, for the most part, your most people are okay with, right? Taking a cold shower, you can turn yeah. the knob to cold, you can go, woo! And then 10 seconds later, you can put it back <laughs> on warm. And most people, especially if you live yeah, even cryotherapy is not a big deal. Yeah, like it's nothing too crazy as long as you like wear the mittens and don't touch yes, the yes. gas and all that, uh, you know, and, and you don't do anything silly. And when you get to cold plunging, deliberate cold exposure, which is where when you look at the research, although it's definitely like we want more, um, it's a lot of positive research around cold exposure when you are submerged in ice, submerged preferably up to your neck, but your body is submerged in ice. No longer is this the thing where we like just put our arm in the cold water because we hurt our arm or in, in ice. Even athletes now don't do that so much anymore. So putting yourself in cold exposure, just if you're listening and you're into it, I so think most people can do this and, and it's not as scary as it seems. Anticipation of the ice bath is worse than the ice bath itself. <laughs> that being said, if you're pregnant and you've never ice bath before, if you have high blood pressure, or you're on some blood pressure medication under supervision of a doctor, if you are um, diabetic, if you have, um, many doctors will say Raynaud's is an issue. If you have Raynaud's, which is a circulation issue, not to do that. I will say that I'm not here and I'm not a medical doctor, but I have witnessed and seen people with Raynaud's mitigating all of their symptoms by taking frequent wow. ice baths. Uh, again, I think for women, less is uh, important to know. Men seem to do better ice bathing, plunging every day if they want. For women, I'm a little more conservative. It also depends on how much stress you show up with, you know, and how long. So there's a lot of, there's a lot to unpack with the ice bath thing, but I would say just know from a medical practitioner, if you have any questions or curiosities thinking, mm, I don't know if this is okay for me because someone who's listening has some, um, something that's in their life and their health condition, check with your person first, check with your functional medicine person, your practitioner, et cetera, and get some green light, um, or talk to a coach. You know, you could always call me and ask, and I can tell you my experience and then you can decide for yourself. Awesome. But the thing I would tell people who want to try it, who feel like they're generally healthy, can get into cold. And in the beginning, especially in the beginning, I think that the best practice you can take is to do some down regulation breathing before you're getting into the tub or the plunge or the barrel or the dip or whatever. Spending a minute or two just understanding how you can calm your nervous system as you stand next to this icy cold water. And then mirroring that breath as soon as you can after you step in the mm. ice because you're going to step in step in all the way up to your neck without hesitation or expectation that's what i say to nine times out of ten to people as they're getting in the tub uh, or whatever dip they're doing it's like no hesitation no expectation just go all the way in right when wim hof somebody was telling me a story about wim hof and somebody interviewing him and you know who wim hof is right he's famous in this world Wim, Wim, you're doing all this amazing stuff. You're climbing mountains and you're shorts and flip-flops or you're, you know, you're getting an ice bath and you're sitting in there all day and you're diving under cold water and channels. And how are you doing this? Like, what's the secret? How are you managing it? And he said to someone, and I would love to find this in writing, but this is the story that circulates. I let it be cold, <laughs> right? We know we're getting into cold water. How do we just let it be cold for the couple of minutes of deliberate time we've decided to spend? Right? I, I say this a lot and now I've been quoted saying it. It's like we don't get in ice baths to get good at taking ice baths. We get in ice baths to get good at life. Just like we're learning and understanding how to manage our stress capacity, our stress load. Right. And so let's do that, right? And you can start wherever you're at. If you're going to get in the ice, I think you want to try to get through at least the first 90 seconds because the first 10 seconds you're like, oh! <gasps> It's cold. You'll have a reaction. You get yourself down-regulated to nasal breathing, longest exhales of the day as soon as you can. Try to be easy. Try to breathe into your body and really open your eyes. Focus on a wide landscape because we are reverse engineering. We're using our eyes. We're telling our brain that we are safe, right? When we are in a heightened state, we're being chased by the tiger. We're in high stress. Our vision starts to get smaller. 
So if we like look at the landscape and we take in everything, we're reminding ourselves we are safe, we are safe, we are safe. If we are breathing then in the cold, not, <gasps> but if we're breathing in the cold, I'm safe, more diaphragmatic breathing, expanding the lower ribs, I'm fine, I'm safe, I'm safe. We can transition the body to go, okay, I guess I'm kind of safe. I guess I can calm down the system. And if you couple that with getting it up to your neck, then you have a response in the body physiologically that will actually slow your heart rate. And you put those two things together and you actually can settle in to something I call the turnover, which we see happen in people about 30 to 90 seconds on the far side. That's why I say stay in 90 seconds, because as soon as 30 seconds or maybe as long as 60, 75 seconds, your body will like turn over and you'll settle in. You'll have a moment that feels like a little surrender mm -hmm. and you'll go, OK, I'm doing the thing that I said I was going to do. This is a little hard, but I'm doing it and I'm OK and I've decided to do it and I can get out when I want. And then you just stay in for another 30 seconds or a minute and try like a two minute ice Amazing. bath. And nine times out of 10, 95 times out of 100, it's not a problem. It's not anything scary. It's not uh, someone won't get out. You know, they'll be able to yes. do it. So I definitely personally want to take an ice bath with you. <laughs> when I can. Anytime you're in Boston and then I'm traveling all over the place, even a little bit all over the world this year. So wherever everyone is, like shout out to me and tell me where you're going to be or like let's book a training at your city, you know? Amazing, amazing. So before we say goodbye for now and I have to be respectful of your time. So I know that you have a, a women's biohacking online course and you have a gift for a listener. Can you share that with us? Yeah, for sure. I am... Um... I have a women's biohacking course. So it's an online health optimization course. It's a group program. It's uh, eight modules plus two bonus modules, all online that I shot video for and I created content for and slides and, and um, short reads in order to make it really approachable and really palatable and um, relatively easy to go through. Like, of course, you're here to learn more about your own body and do a little math and science in there. And then we meet twice a month online and we have uh, do live group coaching and it's a really incredible group of females and that's warrior woman mode online. That's my Instagram handle is warrior woman mode. And the gift that I have for you guys is just, um, if you, we can put it in the show notes, but just to give you $250 off the online course, which is a year. So you get the online course for lifetime access and a year of group coaching. And that, um, that feels exciting. But we can put it in the show notes for people, right? It's, like, it's really great deal if they want to um, do it all at once. It's $250 off. There's also like $99 a month. Like I just wanted to make a course that felt approachable. And a year of coaching with me one-on-one -on -one is, is tenfold expensive. And so that's fine. Some clients want to work one-on-one. -on -one, but if you want to have a reasonably priced health coaching experience, if you are going to show up for yourself then this online course is designed to do that, designed to be in a community of other women who are dealing with life's adventures together and all the information and data that you need to discover your baseline and really improve and optimize your health is there. Amen. Very good. Um, so where can people find you? Where do they go to get this bonus? And uh... Uh, So my new website, I don't know when this podcast is going to launch, but my new website launches on Friday. So I'm assuming that it will launch after Friday. So my new website, super proud of it. It's taken eight months to pull together, but it's wellpower.life. So my podcast is Wellpower, tons of free education and information, W-E-L-L-P-O-W-E-R. My website is wellpower.life. Inside there, there's access points to my um, coaching course. And then... Um, the $250 off code, people will just enter all one word, no spaces, stellar life. And that'll give them $250 off the, the women's online biohacking course and the live coaching that comes with it. I mean, that's the most fun part, I think, is when we all get on the calls twice a month. Amen. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Christine. That was wonderful. I wish we had yeah. more time to speak right now. Uh, thank you for sharing everything that you shared with us. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for the bonus for our audience. And, and thank you, everybody that listened. Uh, we love you. Uh, remember to love yourself in the mirror and take care of yourself. And I urge you to try and take a cold plunge. And Tag me on social if you do. Tag us on social media so we can see it and I can share the cold plunges from, from anyone who's listening. Yes. 
That sounds amazing. So thank you so much, Christine. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, take care of your sweet self, Orion. We'll speak soon. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Have a stellar life. <laughs>